You know, I get a lot of uh, comments from uh, the last post I did and plus some others that concerning uh, divorce, marriage, uh, remarriage, uh, separation. And a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about what it is. And what I'm going to do is give you a biblical perspective uh, concerning the whole matter. Uh, one thing that really bothers me as a trained theologian and Bible student is when I hear people giving what they call biblical advice to somebody concerning a God-ordained institution that is totally wrong. So what I'm going to I'm going to share uh, what the Bible says about it, what it is, what a marriage is, what God's intent was, what God's uh, idea was when He was addressing the Pharisees concerning divorce, separation, remarriage. I'm going to give you all of that right now. Uh, you're free to make comments if you will. I can see them as they come in. I think, uh, but I'm going to explain the whole thing. I, there's probably nothing more devastating than a divorce. Who you married next to put in your trust in Christ is probably one of the most important decisions you can make. Okay, a lot of people are involved. There's a lot of complexities that are involved whenever you get married or divorced. There's in-laws, ex-laws, there's children, there's stepchildren, there's relationship, there's friends, there's all kinds of, of a tangled, you know, uh, involvement that affects everybody. So, and the Bible makes it really clear, God hates divorce. God hates, hates divorce. Okay, and there's a reason why he hates divorce. But you can't really understand that unless you really understand what marriage is. If you remember in the garden, God created Adam. He then brought Eve out of his side. He took a rib. He fashioned Eve, created Adam out of the dust. And he brought all these animals to Adam to name. And Adam was a brilliant man. And he noticed that there was a male and female. And God had him do this purposely, so in his mind, he's thinking, okay, well, where's my counterpart? Okay? So, God puts Adam into a deep sleep, took out one of his ribs and created Eve. And he called her woman. And God said, who he brought together, let no man separate. Okay, now, you, you got to understand what, first of all, what marriage is. It's, first of all, it's a divine creation. In Genesis 1, they were given this oneness to reflect, to rule, and to reproduce. Okay, this is before the fall. After the fall, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to share. I'm going to share with you what happened before the fall, and I'm going to talk about what happened after the fall. Okay, they were a divine creation. God created Adam, and He created him a helpmeet named Eve. Okay, and they were designed for this creation to be one flesh, and I'll explain that to you in a minute as, as well. It wasn't only a divine creation, it was also a human companionship. And that's where you'll find in Genesis 2. Three things happened. They were suitable for one another. They were able to share intimacy with one another. And they were to be vulnerable with one another. Okay? It was also a social commitment. In the Mosaic Covenant, Moses is sharing that it is for this cause that God brought together people, okay? And in that, for this cause, God wanted to accomplish 
a reproduction of what it was like to be one as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are. Okay. Before the fall. Let me just kind of contrast here. You want to take notes? You can. But before I get into divorce, there is no way or even separation that that I'm going to even talk about that to you. First of all, you got to understand the heart of God and why he did what he did and why he hates divorce so much, okay? And the tragedy that it entails everyone. First of all, before the fall, Adam and Eve shared spiritual life together. After the fall, they shared separation from God together. What happened before the fall was ideal. What happens after the fall now becomes an ordeal. What they did before the fall was spiritual. What happens after the fall becomes natural. And then it needs to become supernatural in order to, to function again as the way God intended it originally. Okay, so you got to understand, it's a divine institution created for a divine purpose. Before the fall, both of them, Adam and Eve, delighted themselves in the presence of God. After the fall, they hid from the presence of God. Why? What happened? Before the fall, they didn't have self-consciousness in terms of being sinful because they didn't have a sin nature. After the fall, they became self-conscious. That's why they first recognized they were naked. Children, when they're little and they run around in their birthday suit, they don't know they're naked because they don't have self-consciousness yet in terms of sin consciousness. So before the fall, they enjoyed God's presence. After the fall, they hid from God's presence. Before the fall, they were naked, unashamed, unclothed. After the fall, they were embarrassed, shamed, and God had to eventually clothe them. Before the fall, you had the submissiveness of Eve to Adam, which for her was very natural. That's why God created her. After the fall, that did not become natural anymore. In fact, she's now in a paradox. She wants to both lead and be led. And that emotion is apt to surface at any moment and at any time. That's why a lot of women that they get in struggles emotionally, uh, one minute they want their husband, another minute they want somebody else, or you know, one minute they want him to lead, next minute they want to be led. It's an ongoing emotional struggle for women, and they will continue to have that until they die, or they're living a spirit-led field life. Okay? So, in the before the fall, they shared innocence. After the fall, they shared in guilt. Okay, that's a tremendous burden to carry his guilt in it. Before the fall, there, were, there was a openness and honesty between each other. After the fall, there was fear and hedging. And if you remember, they, were, they began to do the victim thing. They were claiming and blaming each other. Okay. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the devil. They started blaming everybody, and ultimately what they were saying is, God, you did this. They are blaming God. Before the fall, Eve was a helper. After the fall, Eve became a snare. Before the fall, Adam thanks God for Eve. After the fall, Adam blames God for Eve. Before the fall, they shared a home in paradise. After the fall, they shared a home in the domain of Satan. It's where marriages are occupied today. Before the fall, Adam and Eve shared in the work. 
cultivate the garden. After the fall, they were appointed different tasks and different jobs. That's why you have different functions now. You have a hierarchy in the family that God created. It has nothing to do with equality. It has to do with function as an orderly process. Before the fall, work was enjoyable. After the fall, work became a hardship. Through thistles and thorns will you now accomplish your work. Adam listened before the fall to the voice of Eve. After the fall, Adam thinks twice before listening to his wife. Before the fall, they were of one mind. After the fall, they are now what the Bible describes as a mystery. Before the fall, they followed their instructions. After the fall, they followed their impressions, their sin nature. Before the fall, they lived in harmony. After the fall, they lived in conflict. Now you understand something about uh, why God even has Christian courtship as opposed to dating. You know, because courtship was the idea of getting to become, to know somebody, to become one flesh. The concept of dating the way a lot of people do, and especially here in America and other countries, is nowhere found in the Bible. Okay, you know, let me try you first, like trying a car out first and see if it's going to work for me. You know, that's not the idea of courtship. Uh, God has put it in every person, a desire for a companion or a help me. He said, and even in the beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, God has, with some individuals, created within them celibacy. That is, they are under total control, and they don't want the distraction of somebody else keeping them from service and devotion to the Lord. That isn't the norm for most people. That's an exception. Miss Elsie and her sister, uh, Helen were both celibate and they lived in my home for many years and they mentored me and they tra tra trained uh, thousands of, of missionaries and they were an example of people that were celibate and had committed their lives to service for the Lord. But not everybody's that way. Most people have this desire for companionship, okay? One flesh means a couple of things. Okay, first of all, you have a guy and you have a gal. And if you can kind of picture like a triangle coming together, okay, and at the focal point is the Lord Jesus Christ, or, or what we would call one flesh. Okay, so here you have two people, okay, and the idea of one flesh, first and foremost, is spiritual. You got to be spiritually coming together. Second of all, it's emotional. Because God created us as emotional creatures. Okay, and we're coming together. Third of all, it's psychological. Okay, it's a completeness of understanding one another. Fourth, it's educational. Okay, they're learning in shared experience, not just in knowledge, but in wisdom. They're growing in wisdom together. It's also a way of, of bridging that gap culturally, socially, and financially, and even physically. It's bridging all those gaps to where you become one flesh. Okay. I don't know anybody truly that has the capabilities of selecting just the right person for that. It is for that reason that God brings people together to create that oneness, that one flesh. Okay. Now, like, uh, there's a lot of complexities in divorce. A whole lot of them. But you get this idea of people coming together and all, they got a sin nature now and they, they had this in, thing in their mind about this ideal of marriage which they got from who knows television or 
from their workplace or high school or something anymore and they get into this ideal and they find out, you know, this isn't what I thought it was. They recognize now it's an ordeal. So what happens? Now they want to run into a new deal. So they get divorced. Psh, meanwhile, you have all these kids and you have stepkids and parents and, and you got a whole mess. And a lot of times they look for loopholes. They look for ways to get out of this marriage that they feel they should never have gotten into. Okay? You got to remember God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he allows for things to happen. Okay? Even where one person is totally opposite of the other person, and when they come together, they begin to recognize they're not one at all. They're totally different. That is not a bad thing. That can become a completing thing, not a competing thing. If they understand the divine institution of marriage and why it was created and recognize that the gal's a sinner and the guy's a sinner, they're both coming with their own set of baggage and problems. I remember a good friend of mine, he's a pastor up in Colorado, and uh, he had married Miss Colorado, and but their marriage was in real turmoil. And he was telling me one day that he was bending over the sink, washing dishes, and he was thinking, you know, Lord, I could be a really good husband if it wasn't for this wife of mine. <laughs> but just at that point, God impressed upon him, says, yes, but you are a great husband because of this wife of yours. And only you can help her the way she needs to be helped. And it was at that moment that he quit focusing on himself. And he started focusing on her to help her so that they could become one in all those various ways. God often brings people that are completely opposite, which begs another question, and that is the concept of love. The world's concept of love and romance and all these romance novels and movies that are come on is totally unrealistic, okay? For the most part, it has a lot to do with infatuation or lust, not love. See, love is a commitment of the will for the betterment of somebody else. Lust is you can't wait to get what it is you want, okay? And infatuation is, I love you because of, you know, I love you because you got big breasts. I love you because you got nice legs. I love you because you got long hair. I love you because you got a beautiful complexion. I, it's all infatuation because all those things are, are going to change. Not only that, but if you love somebody because there may be somebody coming along that has more of that quality than the person you're currently infatuated with. So right away you got competition. That is not love. Again, that's lust. Or I love you if you provide me with a home. If you have money. If you're good looking. If you have a good job. Those are conditionals that you put on that. That, again, is not love. You go into a relationship and a marriage with because of or if, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. So what happens? One party gets dissatisfied with the other. They get involved in affairs or they commit adultery or they get involved in pornography or they get involved in drugs and alcohol. They get involved in, with their job and they want to spend time away from there. The kids don't want anything. To do. and, and, and you got the process of going for chaos. Next thing you know, you, you, you're filing for divorce. Well, to begin with, you didn't understand anything about marriage. I have people that, that I know, they spend thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for a wedding and a wedding reception and not a single dollar to learn something about this divine institution that God has created. See, marriage is an institution that should reflect God in all its holiness and the way it functions. When your spouse does something wrong, as God did for you, you forgive them. 
Okay? If he deserves punishment and you don't give it to him, you give him mercy. Spouse goes out and commits adultery. She realized she made a really big mistake. She's broken up about it. She feels stupid. I've known lots of women like that. They come back, and the husband has a choice. He forgives them or he doesn't. Those that forgive, they can regroup, gather, and get, marriage can get stronger than ever. Those that have hardness of heart, like a lot of do, a lot of women do, they're not going to get together with that. And you know what often happens is God brings somebody along the same way. They still haven't learned a lesson. You know, and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to go to true the principles a little so that you can understand me. First of all, you got to understand God's heart. God brings people together. Now, that in America, you say, well, I didn't make the right choice. Well, God allowed that to happen there. Even in the Bible times, there were arranged marriages. You know, I think that that isn't the best thing. It does happen, especially in other countries. Uh, I've known complexities where a guy comes to know the Lord. He has seven wives and 40 children. Which wife, is he, which wife should he stay married to now that he's a believer? I mean, you haven't even begun to think about the complexities and the intricacies that happens when the divine marriage institution gets broken down. Okay. Let me talk, let me share with you a few principles about uh, marriage. Okay. Uh, hey, Eddie, we're not talking about golf right now. <laughs> we're talking about singleness, marriage, and family. Okay, so let me let me let me keep going on that subject for now. Okay, first of all, let let, let me just say this: is marriage is an institution created by God for mutual supp supplication, for mutual satisfaction. For meaningful and a meaningful showcase of the relationship of God with his people. Grab that, okay? It's meant to show the world what your relationship is with God. Okay. That's what it's meant for. Since somebody looks at your marriage and hopefully they see what your relationship is with God. What kind of testimony are you giving them? I, I hear, especially women, because I get more comments by women than men. That women come on and that have been divorced and they want to call their ex all kinds of names. Publicly. On posts. They're narcissists. They're psychos. You know, they're this. Or, they should never say anything like that publicly. Okay? When they do that, they show themselves how big they are. Because you know what? That's what you are. You're a sinner too. Maybe not in that area, but in others. You know, I'm thankful that I've had a lot of graceful people in my life that didn't deal with my sinfulness as it deserved to be dealt with. And they gave me a lot of grace. And grace has a way of pulling a person up in a way that the law and hatredness and bitterness could never do. Okay. Now, so marriage is an institution that's created by God for all these mutual benefits. Now, are there exceptions to that? There are exceptions to that. Okay. Although the single state is not the norm, the, as I shared earlier, the gift of celibacy is sometimes given to those whose passions are controlled and whose personality is centered in the person and ministry of Christ. So marriage is not for everybody. Okay. 
but it is for mostly everybody. Now, separation leading to divorce is not the will of God and should never be voluntarily initiated since it militates against God's ideal for union and unity in the marriage relationship. And if you want a reference for that, it's Matthew 19, 6 and 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. Okay? I don't care what the world says. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what the current status says. I care about what God's Word says. Okay? God is the one that thought up marriage. He knows how it can best function and how it can greatly deteriorate and fall apart. And you know who else knows? The devil knows. Satan knows. And he loves to use the media and Hollywood and your ungodly friends or your unbiblically ignorant friends to give you advice that has nothing to do with God's divine institution. Okay? Those are not the voices that come from God. God designs marriage to be mutually beneficial for the interests of all involved and for great joy. But every marriage is going to have problems. And so God also has allowed for prescription for those problems and how to resolve them with all the one another principles throughout the New Testament and by giving us a lot of grace and mercy as he wants us to then extend it to others. Exception. So separation leading to divorce is not God's will, period. Exception. If an unbelieving partner departs, making separation unavoidable, the remaining partner is not bound to prevent the separation unto divorce. Reconciliation, however, is always the first priority of God for the relationship. The second priority is for the unreconciled couple to remain unmarried with a view for reconciliation. Now let me tell you, and I want to be real clear about this. Let's say that your husband went out and committed adultery. You found out about it. You're very mad, and reasonably so. Is that grounds for divorce alone? No. Not if he's repentant. The only time that would be grounds for divorce, if he committed adultery, is if he had a prolonged period of unrepentance and hardness of heart. Because if you could divorce him, for committing adultery, then that would also be true of you too. The Bible says, and Jesus says, if you listen in your heart for somebody else, it's the same as if you've done it. There's a lot of women that like to read these romance novels, and they you know, they go see uh, all these movies that have been coming out, and I think they had millions of American women that went to watch that movie. I don't even know the name of it, you know that explored their secret passions and desires and all that. Well, if you feed yourself with all that, you're going to fall into sin, you know. But we have a lot of ungodly people today, you know. I'm just so thankful I had my grandmother to, to witness and watch. And my grandfather was not a good man, okay, at all, till at the end of his life. And my grandmother's a perfect example, and I often quote 1 Peter 3, of how a godly woman, without saying a word, can win her husband who is not walking with God. And for she did. And not only that, but her daughters observed her, and they followed in her footsteps. And all three of them ended up marrying ministers and having a tremendous impact, even though my grandfather, for the bulk of his life, was very ungodly. He even gave my grandmother a sexually transmitted disease, which she in turn passed on to one of her daughters, 
who had a lot of sickness as a result of it, but God blessed her incredible. And she said to me in front of others how she loved her father and she honored him, even though he did that to her, not directly, but through his wife, through her mother. And she ended up winning thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people to the Lord. And God blessed her now. She's now in heaven with her mother and my grandfather. So when women tell me about their hardship that they've had, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, gain her any respect from me. You show me a woman that sticks thin and thin with the person that she marries because of commitment of their will. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll respect that woman. I don't care what she's gone through. Now, there's a point where it can be dangerous, and, and, and if a guy's doing something like that, then, of course, you're going to separate for a while, but the point is you're going to get back together. You're going to do everything you can to win that man to the Lord. Okay. You know, unless uh, it's just totally, totally. Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah, that's it, Debbie. That was the name of the movie. God help you if you went to see any of you women that went to see that movie. Let's stray from the devil from the pits of hell. Okay. Divorce is always treacherous and hated by God because it transgresses his will for the marital relationship by causing those divorced to commit adultery. Here you have this poor guy who's gone off to the service. He has a little daughter. While he's gone to the service, some guy comes hitting on his wife. They eventually get more than friendly. She commits adultery with him. She now says she's in love with him instead of her husband. She files for divorce. I knew such a woman. Let me tell you, that happened to me. That woman is now dead, along with the guy that she was with. Her life was a disaster afterwards. In fact, she ended up getting divorced from that person, getting married again, getting divorced from that person, ended up dying destitute, cancer-ridden, sickly who at once, at one time, was the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. Why? Because she didn't understand the divine institution of what marriage was, and she didn't understand that a vow that she had made was a commitment to God, not just to her spouse. And the women that don't, and men that don't honor their word, I don't have a lot of respect for them at all. You know, they don't take it seriously. Well, then their word means nothing. Okay, you get in, you get, you marry somebody, you marry them for life. Unless that marriage is terminated because of death or unrepentant heart. By the way, the word fornia, from where we can get the word adultery, does not just cover the physical act of adultery. It's an umbrella term that covers any kind of immorality. Even a housewife sitting and watching soap operas all day or sick shows, that covers ground because what's happened is her emotions are being elicited for somebody else. I've seen that happen with pastor's wives. I rescued a pastor's wife from just about going overboard with a guy that tried to convince her that he had her interests at heart and her husband did not. And she fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Right now, they're back together, and he's doing fantastic in ministry. And she realized the big mistake she almost made. And others did not rescue. Romans 
remarriage. Okay. So you divorced your spouse because they had an affair. Or maybe they yell, they get angry a lot. And you call it being abusive. Now you're single. The Bible allow for you to get remarried? No. Why? Why not? Because you made a vow. If you remarry, then you're committing adultery and causing your spouse to commit adultery. That sounds really hard. But remarriage violates the priority of reconciliation, which is the only reason you would separate or get divorced to begin with, is with the idea of not with, by putting them away forever, but to bring them back. When the Apostle Paul, there was a guy in 1 Corinthians, and he was having an affair, listen to this, with his stepmother. He was sleeping with his father's wife. And the Corinthian church were bragging about it. And the Apostle Paul you told the church, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You need to put this guy out of the church for the destruction of his flesh by Satan. And they did. And in 2 Corinthians, what happens? Paul's writing them to say, okay, his punishment's enough. You need to bring him back. The whole idea of excommunication or separation and divorce is with the idea to bring them back into the rightful relationship in a right way. That is the heart of God. That's what he did with Israel. He didn't abandon them just because they went into idolatry. He kept sending major and minor prophets, even though they were the ones, the ones that were committing adultery. Even Hosea and Mary and the uh, a prostitute as an illustration of what Israel was doing to God. What does God do? He keeps trying to bring them back. Let me tell you something, single women, if you have divorced your husband, you need to go back and reconcile with him if he's not remarried. You don't want to hear that? Fine, go find somebody else that will tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to end well for you. I've seen women that look and men that look for loopholes and try to get around God's design and desire for marriage. And they end, it never ends up right. It always ends up really, really bad. You know who hurts the most? The kids. Let me tell you, I worked for a year in an orphanage. And kids that came out of some of the worst marriages possible. And I've seen all kinds of stuff, you know. And I've seen the heartbreak of the kids to watch their mother and father go separate ways. And what happens to their identity? Who is tied up in mom and tied up in dad. And now they get involved in other relationships and other kids. It's very complex. Is said, any wonder why the kids run off? You know? And what's, what's, what's the reason? Because mom or dad is selfish. Self-seeking. They don't have any sense of forgiveness as God has forgiven them. They don't have any love. They don't have any mercy. And how many people are married right now in name only? Yet you're not functioning as a united couple as the way God intended. God help you. You know, I got a... I never finished high school. And I got a, a undergraduate degree and I got a master's degree in Christian education. And, and one of my greatest teachers, Dr. Howard Hendricks, and he taught 
us a marriage and family classes, which, man, it was awesome. So many things I wish I'd have known many years ago, but I didn't. Okay? So I share this with a lot of conviction, a lot of passion, and a lot of pain. I hate divorce. I don't like to see people get divorced. I would never marry a divorced woman whose husband was still alive. I always tell them, you know what you need to do? You need to go back and get with your husband. And husbands, I tell them the same thing. You need to go back and get with your wives. You know? I've seen God bring back together couples after couples after couples to have some of the strongest marriage and testimonies imaginable and how the kids rejoice in that. At first, maybe skeptical. How is this going to work out? But if there's true spirituality as there was in the beginning, before the fall, then it can make for a beautiful testimony of what the church is like. Before the fall, Adam and Eve had complete fellowship and harmony with God. After the fall, they're going to need help now because of the sin nature. And that's the importance of each husband and each wife being completely submitted to the Lordship of Christ and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit day in and day out and practice the one another principles throughout Scripture. Forgiving one another, confessing your sins to one another, encouraging one another, building up one another, praying for one another, seeking one another's interests ahead of your own. All those principles that should be practiced daily, minute by minute in every marriage. When you have that type of maturity, I don't care what the guy or what the gal does. You have the potential and possibility for making a great life for the whole world to witness especially if it was really bad, you know. If you had that bad husband and you're so good, then why don't you go help him? If he's got struggles and problems, help him. Chances are you got him too. Yeah, guys do it too, huh? That's another thing I say. The minute I start talking about women, the feminists always got to say, well, you know, the guys do it too. You don't need to say that. It's a given. Okay? But you don't need to add that. Okay? The fact is that we're all sinners. When you get married, it's for life until there's a death or if there is unrepentance involved because of the hardness of your heart. When the Pharisees came and tried to test Jesus with the question, what did Jesus say? He said in the beginning it wasn't that way. I shared with you what it was like in the beginning. But because of sin, in other words, what he was saying, it was because of the hardness of your heart, because you got an unforgiving spirit, we're going to allow for these exceptions of adultery of desertion, of unbelieving. But that's only because of the hardness of your heart, because you don't have the kind of love and mercy and commitment of the will to really be in the best interest of anybody. To so go ahead and get divorced. Okay. I've got this thing saved. So, if uh, you want to go back and look at it, do it. But you need to understand how important and how sacred a marriage institution is. And uh, it can be a beautiful thing when done the way God designed it to be. Go out and do the right thing. God bless you all.